In this video we'll take a look at the Heathkit AF1 audio frequency meter, a piece of electronic test equipment dating from the 1950s. Frequency measurement is something that can be done today extremely accurately. Even a basic low-cost frequency counter can measure on the order of six significant digits, much better than say voltage, current, or resistance measurements. This is in part due to the low cost of digital circuitry that can count signal transitions using a very accurate time base. Digital frequency counters came out in the early 1970s, first using neon Nixie tubes for display, then LEDs and LCDs. But back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, other techniques were used to measure frequency. This included using shortwave receivers, crystal calibrators, wave meters, grid dip meters, and analog frequency meters like the AF-1. The AF-1 audio frequency meter is an instrument that measures the frequency of an input signal and displays it on an analog meter. It can measure frequency from 20 Hz to 100 kHz over seven ranges. The input signal must be from 2 to 300 volts RMS and can be sine, square, or other waveforms. Worst case accuracy is stated as 5% of full scale based on a meter accuracy of 2% and circuit tolerances of 3% from 20 Hz to 100 kHz. That means on the 0 to 1 kHz scale, for example, accuracy is plus or minus 5% of 1 kHz or 50 Hz. Typical accuracy should be better since component tolerances will tend to average out to less than the maximum 5%. The unit runs on 105 to 125 volts AC, 50 to 60 Hz, and takes about 35 watts of power. It uses five vacuum tubes and weighs about 12 pounds. It was made from 1951 to 1959 and was sold only as a kit that the user had to assemble. In 1952, for example, it sold in the U.S. for $34.50, which is equivalent to about $300 today. The gray and white styling is typical of Heathkit test equipment of this era. My unit has the gray knobs that were seen on a lot of other Heathkit amateur radio and test equipment. Some photos and catalog pictures show the unit with chicken head style knobs and lighter gray case and red lettering that was used in older equipment. They likely updated the style of the unit while keeping the model number the same. At left is a set of banana jacks for the input signal to be measured. To the right is the range switch with ranges of 0 to 100 hertz, 0 to 300 hertz, 0 to 1 kilohertz, 0 to 3 kilohertz, 0 to 10 kilohertz, 0 to 30 kilohertz, and 0 to 100 kilohertz. To the right of that is the power on off switch and a pilot lamp. The large meter reads frequency with scales marked to 100 and 300. The line cord comes out the back. There's a carrying handle on top and feet on the bottom of the metal case. Operation is simple. You connect the input signal, which must be between 2 and 300 volts RMS, to the input jacks. Select the desired range to attain a meter reading near the upper portion of the meter scale and read the frequency off the meter using a multiplier based on the range selected. Here I've connected the unit to an audio generator, a Heathkit IG72. We need to set the generator to an output of at least 2 volts RMS. We can set the generator to some low frequencies starting with 20 Hz. The meter reads 20 on the 0 to 100 range. Note that the meter wobbles a bit at this low frequency. As we go to 30, 40 hertz, and up to 100, we can read the values off the meter. If we move to the 10 kilohertz meter range, then set the generator to times 100, we can measure a frequency of 10 kilohertz. Finally, we can go to the highest 0 to 100 kilohertz range. With the generator on its highest range, we can measure the output. If we vary the signal generator output level, the frequency reading remains the same. Unless we go below the 2 volt RMS minimum voltage that the meter requires. It's actually more sensitive than 2 volts on the lower frequency ranges. 
This generator only generates sine waves, but the unit will measure square waves or other waveforms, and I've confirmed that it produces the same reading. Incidentally, if we remove the generator and just touch the input with a finger on the lowest range, we pick up AC line hum and see a reading of 60 hertz. This is one of the initial tests listed in the manual. Removing the cover, construction is pretty standard using a metal front panel connected to a chassis which has the power transformer, filter caps, tube sockets, and calibration pots. We have a variety of tube types here, two glass and three metal, one of which is a short height rectifier. There are wire wound trimmer pots to calibrate the unit for each range. I'll cover the calibration procedure later. Under the chassis you can see that all wiring is point to point using the tube sockets and some terminal strips. There's a large rotary range switch. The components under the chassis include various resistors and capacitors. As I'll explain shortly, the yellow capacitors here are not original. If you recall, this was a kit assembled by the user. The person who built this unit did quite a good job, particularly on the wires from the calibration pots to the range switch, which are laced together with some wax string. The circuit is quite simple. The tube lineup consists of a 6V6, 6H6, 6X5, 6JS7, and VR150. A power transformer isolates the circuitry from the AC line and provides high voltage and 6.3 volt filament voltages for the tubes. The power supply circuit uses a 6x5 dual rectifier to convert the AC to DC in a full wave circuit, which is then filtered by three 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors, all contained in one aluminum can. This provides approximately 250 volts DC. To make the meter readings independent of changes in line voltage, a VR150 gas regulator tube is used to regulate the power supply voltage at about 150 volts. These gas regulator tubes do not use a heater or filaments. In proper operation, you can see a nice purple glow. The input signal is amplified by the 6SJ7 tube. If the input is sufficiently high, the tube is overdriven, resulting in some clipping. On the upper trace of the oscilloscope is the input signal from the signal generator, and the lower trace is the output of the 6SJ7. I can vary the input signal level, and you can see how it starts to clip. The signal is then sent to a second amplifier stage using the 6V6 tube, where it's further overdriven. At this point, it should be close to a square wave. You can see it on the lower scope trace here. The square wave goes through an RC circuit, which differentiates it and changes it to a series of spiked pulses, as shown here. The spiked pulses are passed to the 6H6 dual diode, which passes only the negative pulses through to the meter circuit. You can see this here. These pulses drive the meter, producing a reading which is proportional to the frequency of the original signal, but independent of its voltage. According to the manual, the unit can be wired for 110 or 220 volts, and the manual shows how to do this, but the schematic does not. My unit doesn't have the necessary transformer taps to run on 220 volts. I think this capability was introduced later after my unit was produced. Early Heath kits were 120 volts AC only, but as Heath kit expanded outside North America, they began to support 220 volts as well. There's no fuse, but the unit is isolated from the AC line by the power transformer, so the unit is floating with respect to ground. The ground input jack is connected to the case. If I was to use the unit on a regular basis, I would make it a little safer by adding a fuse and a grounded three-prong cord. The unit needs to be calibrated in order to make accurate readings. This can be done using a number of methods which are outlined in the manual. The initial calibration of the 0 to 100 hertz range can be done by connecting the input to the 6.3 volt pilot lamp and adjusting the calibration pot for that range so that the meter reads 60 hertz. The easiest way to calibrate the unit is to connect it to a signal generator with known frequencies. For each range, with a frequency at approximately three quarters of full scale, the calibration pot for the range should be adjusted for the frequency of the generator. 
Many users likely didn't have an accurate signal generator, and the manual outlines a procedure using two signal generators and an oscilloscope that allows starting with a single reference frequency and adjusting the generators for double the frequency using a Lissajuice pattern on the oscilloscope. The initial frequency could be the 60 Hz line frequency or 400 or 600 Hz tones from a radio station like WWV. In my case, I calibrated the unit by adjusting the signal generator to various frequencies as measured using an accurate frequency counter and then adjusting the appropriate calibration pot. I had been looking for an AF-1 at a reasonable price for some time. They're relatively rare, probably because such units were considered obsolete by around 1970 and most were discarded. I bought this unit on eBay in January 2017. It arrived in pretty good cosmetic shape. All tubes were present. It appeared to have all original parts. The meter cover was a little scratched up. After a visual inspection, an initial test of powering it up slowly using a Variac indicated that it was working although out of calibration. It didn't come with a manual. I was able to find a schematic which I think came from the Heathkit specifications and schematics manual which provided schematics and specs for Heathkits back in the 1950s. But I wanted a full manual to get more background on the unit including the theory of operation and the calibration procedure. I was able to find purchased manuals from a couple of sources. Surprisingly the official Heathkit company does not carry this manual. I ended up purchasing a manual reproduction from the manual man. The price was good and shipping cost was reasonable to Canada. It's a high quality reproduction, spiral bound with a cover and a pull out schematic. I noticed a few differences between the schematic in the manual and the one I found on the internet. Two 240K ohm resistors were 220K, a more standard value. There was also a 2700 ohm resistor from the power supply to the first tube stage, which was a wire connection in the internet schematic. My unit matches the schematic in the manual. The manual does not have highly detailed assembly instructions. It explains that since this kit is for experienced builders, they didn't need step-by-step -step instructions. This makes sense as a beginner would not really need such an instrument. The assembly instructions are about one page and list the order of assembly. Chassis mechanical, wiring of transformer, filament leads and pilot lamp, short wire leads, paper caps, resistors, range switch, meter and power cord. The pictorial shows the chassis layout and another the components and wiring. The manual and the unit itself, of course, use the terms cycles, cycles per second, kilocycles, etc., as it predated the common use of hertz as the unit of frequency. The initial checkout procedure is to plug it in and with no input signal, check for no meter deflection on each range. Then it's initially calibrated using the 60 hertz signal from the pilot lamp voltage. Next, one of the calibration procedures described earlier can be formed. The manual lists troubleshooting steps, known good voltages, and a circuit description. Restoration of the unit started with a good cleaning, and I used contact cleaner on the switches and controls. I replaced all the paper caps as these tend to become electrically leaky over the years. The new ones are much smaller than the original ones, as you can see. I tested the paper caps after they were removed and found that they were okay in value. In leakage testing, the large 0.1 microfarad Astron brand caps were all good at 600 volts, but the smaller value Sangamo brand caps were all leaky. In recapping, I noticed one wire connection on a 0.1 microfarad cap that had never been soldered. It seemed to work, but it could have been intermittent. The unit has one modification. The pilot lamp has two 10 ohm resistors in series with it. This was presumably to reduce the brightness. The tubes are GE branded. I think they also have Heath part numbers on them. For example, the 6X5GT is also stamped 57-30. The VR150 tube is marked 0D3, which is an equivalent tube. The 0 .001 microfarad range capacitor has a small 100 picofarad mica cap in parallel with it. 
maybe this was needed to get the unit to calibrate on the highest range. I measured the values of all resistors. Most had drifted a little high, as is typical. Two were quite off in value, and I replaced them. When replacing components, I tried to keep the lead dress the same as shown in the manual, as it can be critical in some areas. The manual says, in all wiring, use spaghetti wherever needed to prevent shorts. Spaghetti is a common term for insulated sleeving. This reminded me of an anecdote from a Heathkit repair technician that at least one customer took this too literally. They couldn't figure out how to use spaghetti, so they used macaroni pasta over the wires. The unit didn't work, so they sent it into the Heathkit factory for repair. I didn't replace the electrolytic capacitors. They measured okay for value and for ESR. I would normally replace them in a unit that would be used regularly for long periods of time, like a radio. This meter will not be used on a regular basis. If I did replace them, I would install the new and smaller caps under the chassis and disconnect but keep the original so the unit looks original. After recapping and resistor replacement, I measured the voltages and compared them to those listed in the manual. All voltages were nominal, but a little on the high side because my line voltage was about 122 volts and the circuit was originally designed for 110 volts, which was typical of the time. I then calibrated the unit on all ranges. The AF1 was a somewhat rare and unusual instrument. It was the only analog frequency meter Heathkit ever offered. It was quickly obsoleted by the digital frequency counters in the 1970s. While the accuracy and size is laughable by today's standards, it was a nice unit at the time that worked as advertised. A similar device is the CM1 capacity meter, which I hope to eventually acquire, as it is also a one-of-a-kind device that was obsoleted by newer technology. I hope you enjoyed this look at a piece of vintage test equipment. Check out my other YouTube videos on Heathkit test equipment, shortwave, and amateur radio products.